Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. It was toward the uh, end of the 1950s, beginning of the 1960s, where the armed forces, the U.S. armed forces, created this alert system to try to help gauge our, our readiness to deal with threats across the world. It came to be known as DEFCON, where DEFCON 5 through 1 were the levels. DEFCON 5 was a time of peace. DEFCON 4, there's increased security. There's, there's more, like, more careful watching. DEFCON 3 means the Air Force is on alert and can deploy within 15 minutes. DEFCON 2 is all the military can mobilize and, and, and deploy within less than six months. And DEFCON 1 meant nuclear war was imminent, and so immediate military response was available. So they created this system, and it was a helpful system to help alert us as to the seriousness of what's taking place. With each descending number, it got more serious. With each descending number, you sit closer to the edge of your seat. Concern begins to rise the closer and closer you get to one. Now, normally at Grace Church, you walk in and you're pretty much at DEFCON 5, right? You're walking in and it's peace. Unless you had a really hard morning with your kids, then maybe you're coming in at DEFCON 4, okay? But, but all joking aside, we're, we're, we come to worship God, we come to encounter God, we come to fellowship with the saints. We want to leave encouraged with the Lord. I, I want that to happen. We love being together as a body of believers. I hope that happens. But I have a duty this morning to prepare you, to alert you from the beginning of this message. This is the rare DEFCON 1 kind of message. This is the rare DEFCON 1 kind of passage that we're going to read this morning. It is a warning passage of the severest kind. I love to joke. I love to have fun. I'm the reigning cornhole champion. There's not going to be many jokes in this sermon. This is the rare DEFCON 1 kind of message. And it's here in our Bibles in the middle of Hebrews because God wants you to avoid disaster. That's why it's here, and I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the text. Because if you take this seriously and you heed this warning, you will be spared from a future that is far worse than nuclear war. And I'm not kidding around. So I'm preparing you now to sit on the edge of your seat, to listen carefully, because Hebrews 6 is one of the most difficult sections in all of the scriptures. Every pastor who goes through a pastor's college knows that, like, the day you preach Hebrews 6 is a terrifying day, and that's today for me. It's difficult for several reasons. First, the content is complicated. Scholars have written books on just these passages. What, what's the basic meaning of these verses? So the, content is comp the context is complicated. The content is sobering also. This is a serious warning, and we're going to hopefully look at the trees, and I want you to lose the forest. I don't want you to lose what the whole book is about. God's using this warning to persevere our faith. And then third, it's very difficult to preach because I know that every one of you is in a different spot in your life. Some of you are, are tender in heart, tender in conscience, some of you, just even the, a flicker of a, of a sinful thought just overwhelms you with discouragement. And, and so you come to a text like this, and you might just feel totally overwhelmed. And so that makes it difficult for me to know how this passage is going to, to hit your ears, and whether I've said too much or whether I've said too little. And so those are the challenges in front of us. I'm going to read the text. We're going to pray together. And we're going to ask God as a community to help us hear from him this morning because this is God's word. So let's listen to God this morning. Speak to us, God. Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity not laying again a, fountain, a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Verse 4, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened 
who have tasted the heavenly gifts and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burnt. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit now to speak to us. Lord, we sit on the edge of our seats. We want to know what this means. We want to hear it. We want to receive it, Lord. We want to persevere. Help us. And I pray that anyone in this room or online watching now who doesn't know the saving grace of Jesus Christ would turn from their sins today and be found in him, dressed in his righteousness alone. God, would you give us all the grace to turn to you again this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In what might be a longer sermon than normal, not obscenely long, but it might be a little bit longer than normal, I broke this passage out into four headings. First, a charge. Second, a warning. Third, an illustration. Fourth, an assuring word. Charge, warning, illustration, and assuring word. And so we begin point one with the verses 1 through 3 with this charge, which is to press on towards maturity. Let's remember the context. So remember last week, as it says, therefore, it's building off of what we saw last week. In the context of this passage, the author has just gotten done saying, hey, you should be teaching by now, but you're like spiritual babies. You should be discipling one another now, but you're not there yet, and it's costing you. You should be acting mature, but you're still acting like a spiritual baby. Babies feed on milk. Their little stomachs can't process solid food. Babies don't realize that they shouldn't pick up marbles and Legos from the ground and put them in their mouth because they might swallow it and die. They lack discernment. But babies aren't supposed to stay babies. The more they eat, the more they grow. The more they grow, the more ready they are for the nourishment of solid food. And the more mature they are, they're supposed to learn not to lick the windows on the car on the way to church. I said there's no jokes. That's not a joke, right, parents? If you're 26 years old and you're still sucking on a binky at night, there's something wrong. That's the assessment that we were given in last week's passage. And we can laugh and make diaper jokes, but it's actually not funny. Christians are meant to grow. And if you aren't growing, it is a sign of a serious problem. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, and you're five years, 10 years, 15 years, and you're still an infant in Christ, there's actually a problem. It's, it's a disease that the author here called dullness of heart, a sluggishness of to, to walk with Christ, a vague understanding of what we mean by the gospel, a disinterest, disinterestedness in holiness, a reluctance to obedience. So yeah, you might say you're a Christian when someone asks you, I mean, depending on who the person is who asks you, right? Because maybe you don't, because you don't want to like, you know, look crazy or anything. But you might say that you're a Christian, but you don't live your life in any discernible ways that would identify you as a distinctly Christ follower, that's who he's talking to in this church. There are those in this church who are really seriously considering turning away from Christ and going back to Judaism. So we've seen in this book already that DEF CON level has already been set to level three, and it's not trending in the right direction. 
So he gives them not only the diagnosis here of the disease, but now he gives us the remedy. Look again in verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. This is, what, this is sort of the, this is what you should do in light of the immaturity that you experience. Leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, he says. So on the high level, I think that command is pretty clear, right? We get that, right? Become mature. Press on. Grow. You got to grow up. You got to grow out of being a spiritual baby into someone who is mature. But the question is, how? And in what ways? And this is the first part of a very difficult section because he says, here's how you do it. Leave the elementary doctrines of Christ. That sounds like he's saying, don't spend any time anymore on the simple matters, on, on the stuff that you already know, on the basics. You got to move on into the deeper stuff, like the, like the, like the meaty stuff. But then look at the list that he gives. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God sounds like justification, how we get right standing with God. Talks about instructions of washing and the laying on of hands, which is like the ceremonial aspects of pious life. And then the resurrection of the dead and eternal life. This is sort of what the future is going to hold for you in the afterlife. And I just ask you, does this sound like elementary doctrine to you? Like when I went to elementary school, we learned basic math, addition, subtraction. We learned two plus two is four. I remember the day I learned the color red in elementary school. We learned how to hold pencils correctly before computers came in the way. These, these are some of the most crucial elements of the gospel. Right? So surely he can't be saying that whole bit about the resurrection and eternal life, <laughs> that's like amateur hour. That's childish stuff. You just need to put that away and go on to something else. What else is there to go to? So what is he talking about here? If we're not supposed to just ditch this into something better, what are we talking about here? So let me acknowledge again that there is debate about this. Some people think that the problem in this church was that they were preaching these, these kinds of things on repeat. And just these things and that these things and that's all that they did. And he's saying, you got you to gotta, you gotta move from addition into trigonometry. So some people think that. I think the context here matters and I think it helps to explain why he lists these six things. Because if you remember, these are ethnic Jews. They're considering turning back to Judaism. And if you know anything about Judaism and Christianity and the relationship, Christianity was birthed out of Judaism. Jesus was a Jew. And so in a sense, Christianity stands on top of the foundation that was laid by Judaism. In fact, it's the true fulfillment of Judaism. Everything from what we read in the Torah and the Old Testament is, is funneling towards this fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And so it's, it's natural for us to understand that there are overlaps between Jewish doctrines and teachings and Christian doctrines and teachings. Some things are the same. Some things are different. Both Judaism and Christianity believe that God is one. Both believe that God was sending a Messiah, etc., etc., etc. So why does he list these six things? I don't think these are here because these are the most important six things that a new Christian has to believe. I don't think this is like the basics of the foundation course for the Christian. And then once you've taken that course, then you move on to other things. I don't think it's designed to be that way because he left off in this list at least one very important Christian doctrine concerning Jesus Christ. Can any of you guess what it is? The cross. Kind of a key doctrine. He leaves off the cross. Remember Paul writes in Corinthians, I resolve to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so this can't be the beginner's course to Christianity without the cross. So why is it here? I think that this list represents the shared doctrines between Christianity and Judaism that any Jewish man or woman would hold. In other words, you don't have to be a Christian to hold these doctrines because these doctrines are also a part of Judaism. They are the foundation upon which Christianity is built on. And for a group of people who are growing weary of standing out in the crowd, they're getting tired of looking like the odd man out, this list is like their safety net. 
You can talk about these things and you won't look too Christian. For the mega churches, this is like the relationship series or the what's playing on the movie series or the financial peace series. Because you don't have to be a Christian to watch the Avengers to want your marriage to work or to want to get out of debt. All of us want that. The author is saying here there is more to Christianity than just playing it safe than just laying the same foundations over and over again. True spirituality builds off this foundation into someone who is radically, distinctively a Christ follower. It costs you something. So I don't think it's meaning leave behind doctrines like repentance from dead works and faith toward God, which Jews believed, but I think it means build off that foundation. Don't lay it again. Build off of it and make your repentance and faith towards Jesus Christ. I don't think it means stop believing in the resurrection of the dead, which would be nonsense. The Jews believe that too, but build off of that and preach that Jesus is the resurrection and he is the one who judges eternally. And eternal judgment will fall on you if you don't turn to Christ. That's distinctively Christian. So for us, it's a call to press into maturity in Jesus Christ, knowing Christ, worshiping Christ, treasuring Christ, following Christ into the hard places of obedience. There's no way around these warning passages. They confront you. And you have to take an honest look at your life and ask the question, am I pressing on in following Jesus? I'm not saying perfectly, but genuinely, are you pressing on? Or are you a cultural Christian who knows the basics, but really you're just living your life for yourself like everybody else in the world? That is the charge. Now, here comes the warning. It is a sobering warning. The warning is this, if you fall away from Christ, you can't be saved. He writes this charge and then he's going to press it further by the word for, verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. My goodness, we have moved from DEFCON 3 to DEFCON 2 and we are hovering over DEFCON 1. This is some of the strongest language that the Bible speaks. Why does he give this warning? I think the reality is, is that no one, not any of you and not me, ever stay in the same place. We don't stay neutral. We are either moving forward on the stream of Christ or we're moving backwards away from Christ. And God is warning us because he loves us and he wants to keep us from destruction. And we find in verse 11, he wants the church here and wants us to have, what does he say? Full assurance of hope. God wants you in this warning to have full assurance. That's what he wants. Doesn't want you to leave feeling like, oh, I'm lost and there's no hope for me. No, quite the opposite. He wants you to have full assurance of hope until the end, all the way. Not sluggish of heart, but an imitator of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. That goes for them, that goes for us. So just my reminder as we start here, God loves you. He gave his son for you. His warnings are meant to help us. Please take this in the spirit that it's given. But if you don't press on to maturity in Christ until the end, you will not be saved. And some who have this knowledge of Christ and then they turn away, they cannot be saved. Saved from God's wrath. Saved from your sins. Saved for heaven's joy, eternal joy. Saved from hell's fire. If you fall away from faith in Christ, you can't be saved. That's the warning. And there's honestly nothing more severe that he could say. Now, who is he speaking about here? Because we, we, we look carefully and we see it's not actually the church itself the church that the Hebrew uh, author is writing to, it's not them 
It's not written to them, about them yet. It's, quote, in the case of those, end quote. Verse 4, in the case of those. And then he paints a picture of a certain group of people. And I want you to think with me, I think this is going to help us in our study, I want you to think experientially about these people. Like, we live life in real time, right? We experience things. I want you to think experientially about these people, and then we're going to come back and we're going to think theologically about these people. But he gives five experiences that mark this group. And if you have been with us from the beginning of Hebrews, you know that he's constantly referencing the Old Testament. And in particular, he's referencing the wilderness generation. And in these five experiences, there are allusions to that Exodus generation. So what are these experiences? First, they have once been enlightened. Light has come to them. They walk in the light. Remember, the Exodus generation walked by that pillar of fire. They have tasted of the heavenly gift. Remember that in the wilderness, God fed the people manna from heaven. They have shared in the Holy Spirit. God's presence was with them in the tabernacle as they moved in the center of the camp. They have tasted the goodness of the word of God. God gave the law on top of Mount Sinai. And they have tasted the powers of the age to come. They stood at the base of the Red Sea and watched God do a miracle and open up the sea and then swallow up Pharaoh and his armies. So these experiences, he's saying, that mirror sort of the Old Testament experience, he's saying if, if you experience this in Christ and you fall away, then you're lost. So who are these people? I'm going to give you three options to try to simplify it for us, and then we're going to look at each one and consider them. First, these are Christians who can lose their salvation. Second, these are people who appear to be Christians but actually aren't. And third, this is a hypothetical that serves as an example but isn't actually true. Let's take these one by one. I'm going to begin with my own, my own, this is my own conviction. I rule out option three, the, the hypothetical example. I rule it out for two reasons. First, there are clearer ways to communicate that you're, you're using an example than the way that he does. For example, see what I just did there? There's clearer ways to go about writing. But the second reason is even stronger to me. If this warning is not a real possibility and it's just a hypothetical, then it doesn't have any real teeth to it. I mean, you can say to your kids, you know, if you don't clean up your room, a dra- I don't know, this would be terrible to do. A dragon from the sky is going to come down and breathe fire on you. And that might scare them until they realize, eh, there's no such thing as dragons, right? It's made up. It's not real. There's no teeth to it. But it's the actual possibility of this happening that is the basis for the whole warning. And so I'm not persuaded by that option. That leaves option one and option two. Christians who can lose their salvation or Christians who look, people who look like Christians and they're actually not. I hope you're all with me still. Let's think about this experientially. What does it look like on the ground? What would it look like among us at Grace Church if, if someone has has had these kinds of serious experiences with God. They've been in the gathering. When the word is preached and their heart lights up and their eyes light up, they've prayed to receive Christ after a service. Their eyes enlightened to this gospel. They've experienced joy and peace in, in what could be described as a supernatural way. They're, they're the kind of person that's so excited about the word, they're hungry to know more. They've had spiritual encounters with God. They were, they were in the room when, you know, Jim and Laura and their daughter and the child was sick and the church prayed and the child was healed. They've seen God's power. What would you think about a person who was like this? You know, we, we go through a process of membership to try to discern who is the visible church, who are, who are the, the true Christians. Well, you would look at a person like this and you'd say, this is the next elder candidate, right? Like this person is not just, you know, nominal Christian. This person is alive in Jesus. It's an impressive resume. And he's saying, it's possible for whoever this kind of person is to fall away from God. That should sober every single one of us. And if this person who has all of these God encounters falls away, it's impossible to restore him again to repentance. This is not like the case of Peter, who you remember denies Christ and then returns in repentance to Jesus and is restored. This is more like the case of, of Judas, who 
If you remember, Judas was sorrowful for what he had done. He was sorrowful, so sorrowful that he went and hung himself. But he never turned back to Jesus in repentance. Or like the later case of, the case that we read later of Esau, who later in Hebrews is referenced as one who couldn't find repentance. There is a difference, and I want to be very clear. There is a difference between falling, i.e., temporarily sinning, and falling away, which is irrevocable denial of Christ. And he says, if Christ was crucified for your sins, and with that knowledge you walk away from him, it's impossible to find repentance because in a manner of speaking, you are turning away from the beauty of Christ in the gospel, and you are picking up a hammer, and you are driving in the nails yourself. You are re-crucifying him. You are joining the crowds yelling, crucify, crucify. And your life has now then become a walking billboard of mockery and contempt for the one who holds out salvation. This has sadly been true of former Christians I've known who at least to this point in their life have not turned back to Jesus in repentance, who once had a seemingly strong faith in the Lord and who have turned away and the warning, friends, listen, could not be clearer. This could be you if you don't persevere. Some of you know the name Josh Harris, author, pastor, phenomenal communicator, loving person. I knew him personally. I sat under his preaching as he became the senior pastor of Covenant Life Church in 2003. I looked up to him. I wanted to be like him. I wanted to have a ministry that was like him. Fast forward almost 20 years later, he's no longer professing Christian very publicly. He's renounced his teachings. He's renounced his books. He's renounced his faith. I could never have thought as I watched him on the stage preaching that he could be in this category someday. Paul Maxwell, Christian author, last year renounced his faith. Rhett and Link, Christian comedian YouTubers, renounce their faith, and so on and so on and so on. If you turn your back on Jesus and persist in your, dis, your deconstruction, persist in it, you, you can't be saved. You won't be saved. You won't even want to be saved. Barnabas Linders wrote, one who insolently rejects the sacrifice of the great priest over the house of God will find that no further provision for sin is available. Wow. How is it possible for those who are once so passionate for Christ to turn around and reject him? I think people deconstruct for various reasons. Some deconstruct for intellectual reasons. They stumble over a doctrine. It doesn't compete with their logic. They think, I can't, I can't believe God would be like that. And so then they harden their hearts against God. Some people deconstruct their faith for moral reasons because they sin and they don't want to humble themselves and repent. And so they separate themselves from their faith in Christ, and I think some people just get tired and weary of the battle. You know what I'm talking about? You just get weary of having to keep fighting, and it doesn't just happen in one moment. It's like a slow drift. The writer of Hebrews earlier says, lest you drift away down that stream. It's not all at once. It's a slow drift. It's like that game that you play when you were kids and you have an object and you're blindfolded and someone's trying to give you directions to it. And they're saying things like, you're warm. You're getting warmer. You're, you're, you're really warm. You're hot. You're so hot. You're burning hot. And then you never actually take hold of the object. You keep going right past it. And they say, oh, you're cold, you're cold, you're freezing, you're ice cold, you're frigid. And you just keep going. Now remember, this is all put in your Bible to encourage you. Aren't you so encouraged? Hebrews 6 takes us to DEFCON 1 to alert us so that we who trust in Christ will persevere. Now let's think theologically about this. One of the principles of Bible interpretation is that since all the scriptures are united and not contradictory, then every passage, in a sense, must be compared to every other passage in the Bible to draw its final interpretation. Meaning, scripture must help interpret scripture. You can't ever have a time when 2 plus 2 equals 4 over here and it equals 5 over here. Scripture must interpret scripture. And the follow-up principle is that the clearer 
more straightforward scriptures help to inform the interpretation of the harder, more difficult scripture. And on this topic, it's not just in one place. It's not in two places. It is riddled throughout the New Testament of what God's view is on this. God will protect all those who are his. This is why I don't believe it's referring to option one. Let me just read a couple to you. John 6, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me. What's his will? That I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. That's pretty clear to me. Then in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hands. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able, no ability to snatch them out of the Father's hands. Off the top of my head, so many other verses come. Philippians, for it is God who works in you. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out in real time, experientially. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Therefore, Hebrews 6, I don't think, can be talking about true Christians who have sinned enough to have lost their salvation because no one could snatch him out of the Father's hand, not the least of which you or me. I think what this is alerting us to is the reality that in fact you can have spiritual encounters, spirituality, and not be saved. I think that's the warning. Like he warns in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not, and look at this impressive list, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. They look great, but they're working against God. Not everyone who has spiritual experiences is saved. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 17 about a sower who scatters his seeds and watches the results. And notice in this that only one, the very last one, is the one who is truly saved. The sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and birds came and devoured them. They heard the gospel, and it did not take root. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up. You see that? There's some evidence of some life there, right? But since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Verse 8, other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain. Some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. The fruit varies in a person's life, but it's on good soil and it's producing its crop. He who has ears, let him hear. So how do you know if you're a true Christian, if you're a true believer, how do you know if you're persevering or how do you know if you're a fake Christian who looks like a believer but who's actually headed for danger? The proof is always in the crop. The proof is always in the crop, what it results in. See, you can have a lot of experiences and not actually produce a crop. There's no mention here of any of the fruit that's being born from this group of people's lives. Ongoing fruit and good works and persevering faith, those aren't, those aren't the things that save you. We're saved by grace through faith in a way that produces good works and produces the crop, but they are the evidence that you have been saved if you persevere in it. That's why he gives us an illustration in verse 7. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop, there it is, useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, which is God, receives a blessing from God. 
But if it bears thorns and thistles, right? Water's falling on it, the rain's falling on it, but it's not producing fruit, crop. It is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burnt. This warning is given to shock you out of the dullness of your hearts. It's given to warn you and to shock you out of your slumber into fruit-bearing repentance. It's meant to shock your system because here is the big idea of Hebrews 6. Only those who persevere to the end have truly been born again. Let me say it one more time. Only those who persevere to the end have truly been born again. Have you reached the end yet? No. No. So only those who persevere to the end are those who have truly been born again. Matthew 10, 22, he who endures to the end will be saved. Hebrews 3, 14, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm to the end. Hebrews 3, 12, take care, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Only those who persevere to the end are truly born again. Now, let me just pour some some balm on you here at this moment. Theologian Wayne Grudem, in, in commenting on this passage, wrote this, and I thought it was so helpful. He writes, in fact, in all of the passages where continuing to believe in Christ to the end of our lives is mentioned as one indication of genuine faith, the purpose is never to make those who are presently trusting in Christ worry that sometime in the future they may fall away. And we should never use these passages that way either, for that would be to give wrongful cause for worry in a way that Scripture does not intend. Rather, the purpose is always to warn those who are thinking of falling away or have fallen away that if they do this, if they do this, it is a strong indication that they were never saved in the first place. When we practice church discipline as a church, we're essentially saying this. We're saying, we believe you're a believer, but you're not walking as a believer. And if you don't keep walking as a believer, we have to suspend our belief that you're a believer. Thus, the necessity for continuing in faith should just be used as a warning against falling away, a warning that those who fall away give evidence that their faith was never real. So now it's time for us to get real. And how does this function for us? And I think it's meant to function as a catalyst for repentance. It's meant to function as a catalyst for repentance, right? Because there are some who can get to the point where they've turned themselves away from Christ and they can no longer repent. So if you can repent, if you can still repent, you're not in this group. If you can turn to Jesus right now, you're not in this condition, are you? There might be a time when God no longer permits you to repent, but you're not there yet. So if you're a true Christian, then stop playing games with your sin and repent. Repent of what? I don't know. What sin is in your life? Whatever it is, repent of it. Repent from the sin that's entangling you. I don't know what's bogging you down in your life. I got got enough of my own sins to repent of. You tell God what it is that's going on in your life. He knows. Come to him. Don't be Judas with your sorrow. Be Peter and come back to Jesus. Repent for making excuses for the way you treat your children, the way you speak to them with harsh words. Repent for the pride that drives you into the work, into your work 70 hours a week when there's no reason to do that. Repent from flirting with your secretary at the office. Repent from replaying that scene in your head of how you're going to get revenge. Repent for losing heart and getting so discouraged about the future when God is so clearly in control. Repent from what you watch on your phone or on TV at night when your spouse goes to bed. Repent for the dullness of heart that puts amusement ahead of growth in God's Word. Repent for arrogantly placing your thoughts above God's thoughts. Now is the time. Repent, repent, repent. And if you do, then this passage will have done its job of keeping you from nuclear war of the soul. It will have been a means of grace to you, and you will show yourself to have always been Christ's all along. I want to leave you now with an assuring word from the end of this text. He sets up this scenario. He charges, he warns, he illustrates, but now he assures. Verse 9. Though we speak in this way, Yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure 
of better things, things that belong to salvation. I feel that way about you. Though we have to talk this way, I feel sure of better things for you, things that accompany salvation, things that possess salvation because of the way that you are living your lives. We see this has been a military exercise, preparing. We're back to DEFCON 5. Verse 10, it says, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Those last four words are very important because it shows that they are continuing on in loving Christ and in serving Christ. It's not their works that save them, but it shows the sincerity of their faith. They are earnestly loving Jesus by how they live their lives, and God will save. Verse 11, And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end. That's what God wants. He wants you to have full assurance so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Isn't it kind of God to go to all these lengths because he wants you to have full assurance of your salvation? He's not looking to condemn you. He wants you to have assurance and to press on with him. And next week we're going to see how it's Christ himself on the basis of the promises who is persevering us until the very end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a challenging word. My soul has been stirred this week, Lord, to not be sluggish towards you. Oh, I pray it would have that effect on all of us, God. That we wouldn't just hear and just go about our day and our week without thought or reference to you. But Lord, you would orient our lives again around Christ and the gospel. His shed blood, his broken body for us. I pray, God, that you would help us to never re-crucify this Son of God, but marvel at the crucifixion that's for us even now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.